Good morning. Today is Monday, February 20th, 2023. There appears to be an incorrect word at the very beginning of our Torah portion. God spoke to Moshe, saying as follows, Daber el Bnei Israel, speak to the children of Israel. Now, what's going to follow is, and say to them, every person should give a gift that will be used to build the Mishkan, the sanctuary. This is the opening of the next five portions of the Torah that cover the building of the Mishkan. And the first thing God says is, tell the children of Israel, each person should bring a gift, an offering of different materials. And the Torah will mention gold and silver and, and copper and, and, and cloth and, and all the different things that are needed. Each person should bring it. But that's not exactly. And, and, and of course, and the purpose, the Mikdash. And all of these gifts are going to be used to build a Mikdash, a sanctuary, the tabernacle, the Mishkan. But that's not exactly what the words say. <laughs> because the words in the Torah, at the very beginning, Daber B'nai Israel, speak to the children of Israel, V'yikhu li truma, and take a gift. Hold on a minute. What do you mean take a gift? Give a gift, right? The point is, <laughs> each person is supposed to give an offering, a gift, a truma, an offering, and that's going to be used to build the Mishkan. Why does it say v'yichu, take a gift? It seems to be the wrong word. And by the way, we better clear up this problem because in two weeks, we have a very special mitzvah that will apply to us about giving. And it's a mitzvah that only happens one day a year on Purim. Please listen. One of the mitzvahs on Purim is matanos levyonim, to give gifts to those who are in need, financial gifts to those who are in need, and that is a mitzvah to do on Purim Day itself. And preferably, it should be given and distributed to those in need on that day. Says the Rambam, Maimonides, mutav la'adam laharbos b'matanos levyonim, a person should designate more of their funds to give gifts to the poor than the amount that they designate for their own celebration meal and to share gifts of food with their friends, shalach manas. So whatever amount you spend on shalach manas, whatever amount you spend on the su'uda, the festive meal, take that amount and a larger amount, says the Rambam, should be given to those who are in need that's the, the, the order of the priorities of the mitzvahs on Purim, according to the Rambam. Now, what's so special about that? There's a mitzvah to give tzedakah, to give money to those who are in need all year long. We always have that mitzvah. But there's something unique, a detail that applies on Purim that does not apply any other day of the year. And this is a halacha. This is decided as Jewish law in Shulchan Aruch, the Code of Jewish Law. Ein medaktikin b'maos purim. We are not allowed to investigate the worthiness of someone who asks us for a gift of money on Purim. Ella rather, call me shaposha yado lito, Whoever extends their hand to ask us for a gift, no stinlo, we're supposed to give to that person. Now, that's not the halacha all year long. Of course, it is a really uh, a, a wonderful characteristic to be so generous to respond to every single person who asks with at least a minimal gift of tzedakah. That's wonderful, but that's not what Jewish law requires. Jewish law says that during the year, if someone asks us for tzedakah, we're allowed to investigate first. We're allowed to uh, go to the length to see, is this person really needy? Is this a, a legitimate cause? Is it a legitimate request? Of course, most people, almost all people who ask us for tzedakah, it is legitimate. But once in a while, there's someone who is not telling the truth, unfortunately. It's rare, but it happens. So 
we are allowed before we uh, 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 designate money to tzedakah to make sure that the 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 purpose that it's being given is being is a legitimate purpose and is being used well. I'll just point out any donations to a death, it's a legitimate purpose and it's being used well. Okay, that's just a commercial message. But on Purim, no, no investigating. Whoever puts out their hand to ask on Purim, you have to give at least a minimal amount. So, all right, <laughs> we'd better be straight <laughs> on what this confusion is over giving and taking because we have to be giving. So what does it mean? There is a similar confusion in the book of Ruth. Remember the story. Rus, Ruth, is a woman who has come back with Naomi. She's converted to Judaism. She is impoverished. She is going to collect funds, tzedakah funds, from other people. And she ends up in a field that's owned by a man named Boaz. And Boaz is very generous with her. And Boaz makes sure that she's able to take food home for herself and for her mother-in-law, Naomi. And she is able to bring this food back and they're able to support themselves. They're able to, 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 to eat. It's a wonderful, generous act that Boaz does for Rus. Listen, though, to what Rus says. When Naomi says to her, Wow, you brought back all this food. Where were you today? Who was so generous with you today that you brought back all this food because we don't have any money ourselves? Who was so generous to you? Vatomer, and Rus says, shame, ho okay, so before I read it, what she's going to say is, the man that was so generous with me, his name is Boaz. Okay, now, the rest of the story goes on. Naomi's going to say, oh, he's actually our relative and they end up getting married. All right, that's the story, but... Listen to the verse. Vatomer, and Rus says, Shem ho'ish, the name of the man, asher asisi imo, the name of the man that I helped him today, Boaz. His name is Boaz. Wait, hold on. <laughs> Doesn't make sense. She received the gift of tzedakah from Boaz. But she says, the man that I helped, what do you mean? You helped him. He helped you. What do you mean you helped him? Which is it? Is it giving or taking? So listen carefully, please. Listen to what our rabbis say. Our rabbis say, Malame, this comes to teach you. She yoser me'asher balabayas osi More than what the giver does for the recipient the recipient does more by giving the giver the opportunity to be able to help another person. We look at it backwards. We think that the giver is the generous one who gets the big mitzvah of tzedakah, and the recipient is the recipient. Just the opposite. Why is it the opposite? Listen to this explanation by the um, Torah Tmima. The merit that a person gets from giving tzedakah is greater, is a greater value than the amount of money they give to the person in need. When you give, you are getting you are receiving more than you're giving. I heard this story from Rabbi Yisachar Frand. There was once in the 1920s in New York, a very wealthy man, his name was Rab Mr. Schiff. Mr. Schiff, a very wealthy man, religious Jewish man. And Rabbi Moshe Mordechai Epstein, if you remember, I mentioned his name to you in a different context last week. Okay, he was the head of a yeshiva, and he came to New York, and he was collecting funds for his yeshiva. And this man, Mr. Schiff, gave $25,000 as a donation to his yeshiva. $25,000 in the 1920s, that was real money. Okay, very, very generous donation. A couple years later, 1929, the crash, the depression, Mr. Schiff lost everything. All of his money all of his homes, 
all of his possessions. He was reduced to living in the basement of one of the apartment buildings that he used to own. The next year, another representative from the same yeshiva came and had another meeting to collect funds for his yeshiva. And Mr. Schiff came to this meeting also. This representative from the yeshiva had heard what had happened to Mr. Schiff, the dramatic uh, uh, change in his, in his circumstances. He had lost everything. So this man from the yeshiva said to Mr. Schiff privately, he said, we are so grateful that in the past you generously donated to yeshiva. The yeshiva, which, and you understand, a yeshiva is not a wealthy organization. The yeshiva wants to offer you to give you a, a loan of $5,000 until you can get yourself back on your feet. What an amazing thing. What an amazing act of kindness. And the yeshiva certainly couldn't afford it to begin with, but they were so grateful for what he had done to them before, they wanted to try to help him in his, in his moment of need. Mr. Schiff said to this man who was offering the money, I'm not going to take it, and I can't even understand why you're offering it to me. He says, you know what happened to me in 1929, the Depression? I lost everything. I lost my stocks. I lost my money. I lost my buildings. I lost everything. The only thing I have left is the merit of the $25,000 that I gave to your yeshiva. And you want to take that away from me? I would never allow you to do that because what I gave to you is now the only thing I have left. When God says to donate to the building of the Mishkan, it's not because God needs the money. God can build the Mishkan by himself. He doesn't need my money. He doesn't need your money. Rather, God is saying to the Jewish people, I am giving you the opportunity to share in this great and holy endeavor it is an opportunity. It is a gift that I'm giving to you to be able to donate to this cause. The donation you give is my gift to you, says God. Later, we're going to learn about the Nisim, the princes of each tribe. And we're going to learn that they made an offer, which I believe any Jewish organization today would jump at accepting this offer. They made an offer and they said, let the Jewish people give whatever they're going to give. We'll cover the deficit. Whatever is left over, we will take care of. <laughs> it's pretty amazing, right? But they were criticized. First, it happened that the Jewish people themselves brought all that was necessary, and there was nothing left for them to donate. But they were criticized because they didn't understand. God wasn't asking for the donations because there was a deficit. God was giving an opportunity to be able to share, and they didn't see that, and they missed their opportunity. I want to share with you a fascinating technical demonstration of this. All right. So marriage in Jewish law between a chasan, a groom, and a kala, a bride, is affected by a kinyan. A kinyan is an action where the chasan, the groom, gives an object of value to the kala, to the bride, like a ring. And when the bride receives the gift of value, that creates the marriage. Okay, that's a, called a kinyan, and that creates the marriage. Says the Talmud, sometimes the groom can receive a gift from the bride, and they will be married. Now, that just sounds crazy, because that's just the opposite of what the process is. I told you the process, the groom has to give it to the bride, the bride has to receive it. It's the bride receiving the object of value that makes them married. So, what does the Talmud mean when it says, the groom can receive it and they'll be married? It's the opposite. The Talmud explains, Adam Chashuv Shani. It's talking about a case where the groom is a very, very important person. A person like a president or a king or such a respected person. Can you imagine if you were to offer a gift 
to a very, very important person. And that person would accept the gift. You would feel so good. I gave a gift to the king and the king accepted it. I gave a gift to the president and the president accepted it. I would feel really good. I would feel that I had received something by such an important person accepting my gift. In that example, receiving the gift can be giving value to the giver. So when the giver, in this case the kala, the bride, feels she's giving a gift to the groom, right? But when she feels that she has gained more by the groom accepting her gift than she has given, then she has received something of value. And that is how she is married. Sometimes we're asked for help and we can't do it. Maybe we can't afford it. Maybe we're asked for something else other than money and we just don't have the ability to do it. A big part of my work, a very, very difficult part of my work, happens quite often. Someone comes to speak to me. Of course, I'm not going to share any details. But they come to ask for my help with a problem, a crisis. And the situation could be something that is so horrible, so catastrophic, you cannot imagine, I could not have imagined such a problem and a crisis existing. Just a horrible, horrible nightmare. And the nature of the problem is wildly beyond any expertise or help that I could offer. I mean, it, I'm just not in the, it's just not in the ballpark. So when that happens, there are only two things that I can try to do. The first is I can try to use my best judgment at least to think of which professionals they need to speak to. And often it's more than one professional, more than one area of help that they're going to need. So at least, I mean, if I could at least guide someone to where to get the right help, that's a, that, that can be, you know, I mean, that could be as much as I could do. But more than that, I can listen and I can cry along with them. And sometimes the willingness to be wounded by being upset at another's problem by expressing our concern, by shedding a tear with them, even without being able to help them, even without being able to give anything, sometimes that may be all we have to offer. And that is also a gift. Any gift we give, a gift of money, a gift of time, a gift of effort, a gift of sensitivity and caring, we are doing ourselves the favor. It's not the other way around. And when that happens to you, when you are approached, take the gift that is being offered to you, the yikhuli truma, take the gift that is being offered to you by giving to someone else and then say thank you for letting me help you. My friends, I want to wish you a great day and I look forward to seeing you soon in person.